we were almost there. And because the vote, we knew it would be, would be close in the Senate on the night of the last vote, the key vote, the Vice President of the United States sat in the presiding officer's chair in his constitutional role as President of the U.S. Senate in case we needed him to break a tie, just as Vice President Spiro Agnew broke the tie in 1973 to pass the Trans-Alaska Pipeline Bill in the Senate. So I walked up to the Vice President during this time, and he told me how historic this was, how many times in the House he had voted for, to open ANWR. And I looked up in the gallery at the many Alaskans who were watching this debate, and had literally flown thousands and thousands of miles to watch. And I asked the Vice President for a favor. I said, can you give them a, a, a thumbs up, a sign? He looked up, smiled, and gave a huge thumbs up to all the Alaskans who were sitting in the gallery. And they responded. <laughs> and they responded with their own fist pumps and waves. And it was exciting. Now, one of these Alaskans in the gallery that night was Matthew Rexford from Kaktovik, which is in Anwar. And in testimony a few weeks earlier before the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee, I think Matthew spoke for our whole state when he said the following, the Arctic and Nupiat will not become conservation refugees. We do not approve of efforts to turn our homeland into one giant national park, which literally guarantees us a fate with no economy, no jobs, reduced subsistence, and no hope for the future of our people. That was his testimony in front of the United States Congress. Now Matthew was part of a long line of Alaskans, Democrats and Republicans, literally thousands, who have worked for decades to lay the groundwork for that night's historic vote to open Anwar. And I want to recognize that many of those Alaskans are actually here in this body today. I want to salute you with a round of applause for a job well done. I think it's great. But the Alaska economic comeback is not just about Anwar. Several new discoveries and developments on the North Slope, from fields like Mustang, Greater Moose's Tooth, Nuna, Liberty, Pika, Putu, Willow, and Point Thompson, and progress on the gas line all point to the potential for billions of dollars of new investment, significant increases in taps, throughput, and state revenue, and hundreds, if not thousands, of good paying jobs for Alaskans. I believe that we are on the cusp again of becoming one of the hottest energy plays in the world. But we need to seize the opportunity now. At the federal level, we are putting policies and importantly, personnel into place to do this. But it will be largely up to you to bring the investors here. The decisions you make matter immensely. Just as this body's decision to pass Senate Bill 21 resulted in more investment, more oil, and more revenue, even as prices collapse, the policies you will enact here will dictate whether or not we will seize this moment of opportunity. And of course, it's not just oil and gas that drives our economy. Our state has the most sustainable, abundant fisheries of any place on the planet supporting tens of thousands of jobs in our state. As the chairman of the state subcommittee in charge of our nation's fisheries, I'm working to make sure that Alaska remains the superpower of seafood by increasing market opportunities for our world-class products, streamlining federal re regulations that offer and cumber family businesses, family-owned vessels, as well as the activities of our sport and subsistence fishermen. Third, we want to live in healthy communities with clean air and clean water. A strong economy is worth nothing if it destroys our environment. We are all committed to protecting our state's environment and preserving its natural beauty. To that end, this legislature has enacted some of the most rigorous environmental standards of any place in the world. But we don't always have control of what washes up on our shores. 
Every year, millions of tons of waste enter the ocean, mostly through Asia. This pollution, most of it plastics, ends up on our shores or breaks down into tiny pieces that can enter the marine food chain and harm fish and wildlife. And Alaska bears the brunt of this crisis because of our extensive shorelines and our unique reliance on oceans and rivers. Last year, I authored legislation with Democratic Senator Sheldon Whitehouse to tackle this crisis called the Save Our Seas Act. The bill boosts the federal government's domestic and international response to ocean waste and empowers NOAA to declare severe marine debris emergencies and authorizes additional fundings to states like Alaska for cleanup and response efforts. It also directs the State Department to undertake negotiations with other countries to address this challenge internationally. Our bill passed the Senate already, and we're working to ensure it passes the House. <laughs> and we're also making a progress on another important oceans issue, particularly here in Southeast, and that's the transboundary mining issue. A few weeks ago, Lieutenant Governor, and, uh, Lieutenant Governor Malott and I traveled to Canada to meet with cabinet officials to re request specific action by the government of Canada on this issue. Now, I, I must admit we were a bit of an odd couple, a Clinkett Democratic <laughs> Lieutenant Governor and a white Republican U.S. Senator. I think we confused the Canadians even more when we began most of our meetings by mentioning that we were actually related. <laughs> it's true, our wives, Julie and Tony, are cousins. But our trip to Ottawa showed the Canadian government a powerful unity, which now includes the U.S. State Department, whose officials are taking transboundary mining issues much more seriously than the previous administration ever did. Healthy communities also means access to affordable health care, a huge, huge challenge in our state. There are principal differences in much debate on this issue, but even here, we've made progress in the past year. Thanks to your innovative legislation from this body, the Trump administration granted Alaska the first 1332 waiver of any state in America. This helped decrease premiums in the individual market for the first time in recent memory and will bring approximately $320 million of federal support back to the state for our individual market. The U.S. Congress recently has acted on health care legislation. We reauthorized CHIP, the block grant program which covers Alaskan kids and low-income families for 10 years, and we fully funded community health centers which play such a critical role throughout our state. We delayed the Affordable Care Act's Cadillac tax, which it ever kicks in will devastate Alaska's fragile health market. And we repealed the ACA's individual mandate, which taxed Alaskans for not buying a product they couldn't afford. Think about that, for not buying a product they couldn't afford. Not only was this an affront to individual liberty, it was a regressive tax that hit middle class and working class families the hardest. Close to 70% of the Alaskans who had to pay this penalty made $50,000 or less. With the individual mandate gone, Obamacare is now truly voluntary. Now, I recognize that health care costs are strangling most Alaskans and the state's share of Medicaid costs are impacting a growing portion of the state's budget. I took note when Senator Peter Michicki said during a recent hearing that we are close to being swallowed by the costs of health care. I know that all of you in the legislature are working hard on this issue, on ways to bring down costs and keep them under control, and so are we. We came close last year to making the federal formula for Alaska's Medicaid match much more equitable, which would have saved the state hundreds of millions of dollars. And you have my commitment to continue to work with all of you on these vital issues. Fourth, we want to be safe 
in our homes, villages, neighborhoods, and schools. And I think we obviously have a lot of work to do in this area. I hear from Alaskans over and over again about cars stolen, about houses broken into, shootings on our streets. In certain communities, it's something that resembles almost mayhem. We have to do everything we can to protect our citizens. This also means making sure our kids are safe in their schools. The horrific high school shooting in Florida has scarred the conscious of our nation and catalyzed an important national discussion on school safety. Regardless of where we stand on these issues, young Americans across the country who are speaking out, some of whom are friends and families of the victims, deserve to be listened to. I will carefully evaluate proposals on the federal level. However, as Alaskans, we understand how important our Second Amendment rights are. We use fire, firearms not only for self-defense, but as a tool to feed our families. And in many ways, we are unique from almost every other state in the nation on this issue. We also have to get to the root cause of the crime wave sweeping many Alaskan communities. The opioid epidemic and gangs related to the drug trade are certainly fueling this. As some of you know, I've been very focused on all aspects of the opioid crisis. Two years ago, we hosted a wellness summit at the Matsu College, where hundreds of Alaskans gathered to listen and learn and exchange ideas from each other and gain inspiration. It wasn't just a talk fest. For those who were there, a lot of action-oriented ideas involving federal legislation and funding came out of that and became a reality. We are building that. We are building on that. The recent two-year federal budget deal dedicates $6 billion to addressing the opioid crisis for states. And I'm working on an update to the Comprehensive Addiction and Recovery Act, the CARA Act of 2016, with some of my Senate colleagues. But more needs to be done, and I know Alaskans have ideas. So we are planning another wellness summit this summer, this time not just focus on our addiction epidemic, but on combating the crime wave that is victimizing so many Alaskans. Stay tuned. We will need your help. We will need your input for good ideas that we can act on. Now, being safe also means combating sexual assault and domestic violence, which many of us in this chamber have been working on together for years. The Choose Respect initiative was one of the most comprehensive statewide initiatives in the country that set out to tackle this very difficult issue. I brought many ideas from Choose Respect to the US Senate, including a bill called the Power Act, which recently passed the Senate and would provide increased legal services to survivors of domestic assault, domestic violence, and sexual assault. There's so much more to do. Just like addiction, the scars from these crimes can pass down through the generations. We've known for a long time that Alaska has a big problem in this area. What happened this year is that in the rest of the country, from Hollywood to Washington, D.C., to the New York media establishment, the rest of the country woke up to the fact that they, too, have a problem, a big problem. I commend the brave women who have come forward with their stories, including in Alaska. They are changing Alaska and the world 